It was toward the end of his life, in the fourth century before the birth of Christ, that Plato set down in writing the story of Atlantis, the only written account of it in all of antiquity. According to him, the account is fact, not fiction. I've been reading this book. It's, uh, it's about a dinner party, a symposium. Um, and the author is, is Plato, but Plato is not a major character here in the symposium. It's his uh, mentor, uh, Socrates. Uh, Socrates is the guy who took Hemlock. You would probably remember him. Uh, in any event, this is a book about people that we know actually existed, all except one of them. There's a, a character by the name of Timaeus, and Timaeus we have no historical record of. But uh, Critias was Plato's great-grandfather, and Critias also plays a major role here. The discussion of Atlantis starts with Timaeus, but actually it's Critias that tells us the most about him. Now, Critias didn't hear this story himself personally. He got it from his grandfather, who, confusingly enough, was also named Critias. And Critias didn't hear it himself either. He got it from his father, Dropides. Now, Dropides didn't uh, hear it directly exactly. Uh, well, he heard it from Solon, who had gotten it from some Egyptians. Solon was at a dinner party, much like the symposium that the book is about, and he was talking to Dropides about the story that he heard in Egypt about Atlantis. Now, the Egyptians were telling Solon this story because Solon had been bragging about Greek history and the Egyptians just couldn't stand it so they were really going to put him down so they told him the story about Atlantis they may have just made it up in any event the story of Atlantis goes back 9,000 years so the chances of the Egyptians getting the story exactly right seem difficult. Not only that, you have the problem of the translation between the Egyptians and the Greeks. The Egyptians may not have understood Greek very well, and Solon probably didn't understand Egyptian at all. So there could be something lost in translation. And then, of course, there's the fact that Solon tells it uh, at a dinner party. Uh, Dropides hears it, passes it along to his grandson, and he passes it along to his great grandson, who tells Socrates about it. And even that is recorded by Plato. So there's lots of different places where this story could have fallen through the cracks. Nonetheless, it's here in Athens that the story starts because that's where the symposium, the dinner party is. Now we're going to make an assumption uh, that Plato didn't make up this story. The Egyptians didn't make up this story. Uh, this story of Atlantis actually happened sometime in the distant past and that information about it was transmitted uh, through all these generations uh, without any error or loss. Of course, I can't read Greek, uh, but fortunately on the right-hand side of the page there's an I English translation of the Greek, and we're going to go through uh, the Critias, and we're going to mark out all of the important facts about Atlantis and see if we can locate it. Uh, Atlantis is described in about 25 pages, and in that 25 pages there are a number of key elements uh, that will help you to locate where Atlantis was, if it was ever anywhere. 
On this page, we learn that the uh, demise of Atlantis occurred 9,000 years before the time of Solon. Uh, that would make it between 11 and 12,000 years uh, back from the present. Uh, we also learned that it is beyond the uh, pillars of Hercules, and I'm going to get back to that in a second. Uh, we uh, also learn that it's larger than Libya and Asia combined. Now, uh, that's less helpful than you would think because Libya and Asia have been of variable size uh, over a period of time. Uh, we also learn that there's been a barrier of impossible mud. That barrier of impassable mud uh, that the ships couldn't go through, that could actually be something other than mud. It could be pumice, uh, which floats. Uh, if there had been a, a volcano go off, it could have left uh, a barrier of pumice on the, on the sea uh, that the ships couldn't go through. According to the Egyptians, the continent lay beyond the Pillars of Hercules, thought to be the Straits of Gibraltar. This was the gateway to the Atlantic Ocean, a place the Greeks had only heard about. Now, the Pillars of Hercules are generally reckoned, uh, and they were in ancient times, uh, to have been the Straits of Gibraltar. The Straits of Gibraltar is the modern term. Uh, ever since the Moors invaded uh, Spain, it's been called Gibraltar. That is actually an Arabic uh, term that's been transliterated into English and other European languages. The term the Pillars of Hercules could actually apply to a couple of other different places uh, in the Mediterranean uh, in at least very ancient times. It could very well be that the Pillars of Hercules that's referred to in the Atlantis legend was actually the Straits of Messina uh, in between uh, Sicily uh, and Italy, uh, which is going to appear on the left-hand side. Or it could be uh, the Bosphorus, which leads from the Mediterranean into the Black Sea, and that appears on the right-hand side. In any event, my point is that the Straits of Gibraltar and the Straits and the Pillars of Hercules uh, may not necessarily be uh, the same thing. They could very well be other choke points as well. Other things we know about Atlantis is that it produced Aurichalcum. Now, nobody knows what that stuff was. Uh, they say that it was the most precious metal except for gold. The only candidate that I know of is electrum, which is a combination of gold and silver. It could have been that. But the island also had uh, timber, and uh, it had a very large stock of elephants as well. Apparently, the island was quite lush. He puts in elephants. In fact, it's only the second time that uh, they're mentioned in Greek literature when Plato describes Atlantis. This island city was described as being laid out in a series of concentric circles of land and water, each one connected to the ocean by an immense canal 100 feet deep. Further along, Plato records how Atlantis was actually a series of uh, land and sea circles um, and of course what he's talking about here is really not the continent of Atlantis but the capital city and how they opened up channels to uh, get from the main part of the city out to the uh, open sea. The Critias recounts not only how many circles of land and sea there were in the capital, but also what the width of those circles happened to be. And if you count them all up, it's less than or just about three miles in diameter. For construction materials, the Atlanteans often used red and black and white blocks of stone. Uh, now, the reason for this appears to be because those were the colors of stone that were most common in Atlantis. Remember, the red and black and white stone blocks were coming back to them. One of the things that Plato tells us about Atlantis is that the land is full of red and white and black rocks. But where are you going to find such a place that has red and white and black blocks, stone blocks, all in the same place?
Plato further recounts that the central island had two different kinds of springs, one being cold and one being warm water. Uh, this suggests that there was a volcanic uh, element someplace in that island, otherwise there wouldn't have been that warm water. To the north, the continent of Atlantis had mountains, but then there was a plain, and that plain was 60,000 square miles, and uh, the area was full of people, apparently. If you take a look at the calculations for the size of the army and navy that they could uh, field, uh, you come up with a number of nearly 200,000 men, soldiers and sailors combined. In ancient times, uh, countries could field an army roughly 10% of their total population. That suggests the total population of Atlantis must have been about 2 million. Finally, Atlantis seems to have been involved in the worship of bulls to some extent, or at least the bulls were involved in their religion in some particular manner. As I counted, this makes about 17 different elements that you can look at to tell whether or not a particular place happens to be Atlantis. Atlantis was dominated by a vast, almost perfectly rectangular plain, surrounded on three sides by high, very beautiful mountains. Possessed of abundant natural resources, rare plants and precious flowers of every description, even elephants and other exotic animals, Atlantis was a land like no other where the people wanted for nothing. Because of the size description of Atlantis, the fact that it is outside the Pillars of Hercules, and the fact that it had elephants, traditionally many uh, cartographers had located it either just outside North Africa or just beyond Spain. Now for the moment, let us focus on the bull-worshipping aspect of the Atlanteans. Uh, we know of another culture uh, in the Mediterranean uh, that also worshipped bulls. It was the Minoan culture. So let us go back and take a look at the myth of Minos. You remember the story about Theseus and the Minotaur. Well, what had happened on Crete is where it all gets started. Apparently, the queen of Crete had a close encounter of the very friendly kind with a, with a bull. And the result of that uh, was that she gave birth to a half-man, half-bull. And that's the Minotaur. The Minotaur is kept down in a labyrinth. Uh, we don't know exactly where that was. It could just have been the, the palace. If you take a look at the palace, it looks very much like a labyrinth. There's about a thousand rooms in it, and it uh, seems very likely that somebody who is from a village uh, might not have known anything any more elaborate than that labyrinth. In any event, the king, Minos, uh, goes out to all of his subordinate uh, colonies and uh, subordinate states and he requisitions from them some young people to sacrifice to the Minotaur. Actually, the Minotaur kills them and eats them. And every few years they collect up people and take them out there. And Theseus was the son of the king of Athens. Uh, the king of Athens' name was Aegis. Uh, in any event, Theseus volunteers to go to Crete. Now his idea is he's going to kill the Minotaur. Now uh, that's not something that anybody else was planning to do. Nobody else was a volunteer. And when he gets to Crete, uh, from some distance, I assume, the princess uh, sees him and she thinks he's just wonderful. So she comes to him uh, one night uh, while he's in a holding pen of some kind waiting to be turned loose in the labyrinth and 
he explains to her that he's going to kill the Minotaur. And uh, she asks him, how are you going to do that? And he doesn't have the foggiest idea. At this, the princess falls madly in love with him. Uh, this guy is brave, he's strong, and he hasn't got a, a brain in his head. Obviously, he's marriageable material. The princess's name is Ariadne. Ariadne uh, goes and gets a dagger to give him so that he can kill the Minotaur. And she gives him something called a clue. Now, in Greek, a clue is a ball of yarn. And he needs this ball of yarn so that he can string it out as he's going through the labyrinth, kill the Minotaur, and then be able to find his way back. In fact, he does find the Minotaur, he does kill it, he does find his way back, and he picks up Ariadne and they take off in his ship. Now at this point, there's a couple of different versions. Uh, one version is they land at Cyprus and uh, she dies in childbirth at Cyprus, uh, he having abandoned her sometime before that. In any event, as Theseus is coming home uh, in his boat, there's a prearranged uh, signal. Uh, the color of the sail, whether it's white or black, will tell uh, the city whether Theseus is alive or is dead. And for some reason, which is not terribly clear, the wrong sail is hoisted on the ship as it comes into view. And the result of that is the king of Athens believes that his son is dead and he jumps off a cliff into the Aegean Sea. His name was Aegis and that's how the Aegean Sea got its name. Now, that means that when Theseus lands, he's king of Athens. And I suspect that there is more to this story than the Greeks knew or were telling at least. I suspect that maybe that sail business was not a mistake, that uh, the king committed suicide to make way for Theseus, but that's neither here nor there. The point is, bulls were big in Crete. They were very important in the religion, and that's reflected in the, the mythology. The first archaeologist here in Crete was Sir Arthur Evans. Evans began his search in a hilltop settlement called Knossos. He soon found something that was beyond his wildest dreams. Now, when Arthur Evans, the first archaeologist to, uh, to work on Crete, started his work at Knossos, one of the things that he noticed was that there were a fair number of depictions of bulls. And that brought the story of Minos to mind, and that's why he referred to the culture as Minoan. Uh, the bulls seem to have been involved in some kind of a bull leaping ceremony. It was probably part of the religion, but of course that's not entirely clear. Uh, what happened was uh, young guys uh, got in front of the bull. They grabbed the bull's horns, and as the bull was about to make contact with them, it naturally threw its head up. And as it did that, because they had hold of the horns, it threw the uh, boys over the back of the bull, and the boys did a, a somersault and landed on the ground behind the bull. Incidentally, it may not have been just boys that were doing this bull leaping. Uh, boys in Minoan art are usually depicted in red. Girls are usually depicted in white. Sir Arthur Evans also noticed other aspects that might have tied in with the old Minoan legends. Uh, for example, the uh, palace itself uh, was spread over a very long distance, very large distance, and it had over a thousand rooms in it. And uh, those buildings were three, four, five stories high, something that was unheard of in this period of time. Uh, we're talking about roughly 
of 1500 BC. Incidentally, the symbol that we're zeroing in on uh, represents the bull's horns in Minoan art. Sir Arthur Evans discovered an amazing architectural design and the frescoes were absolutely fantastic. This brings up a question. Was there a mathematical error? Uh, was there a problem with translating from the Egyptian to the Greek? Was it not 9,000 years before the time of Solon, but only 900? If it was 900, then the Minoan civilization may very well be the one that is the inspiration for Atlantis. Maybe it was Atlantis. Could translation errors also have obscured the time period when Atlantis existed? Solon claimed it was at its peak 9,000 years before his own time, but 900 years is more likely. It was then that cultures strikingly similar to that of Atlantis thrived throughout the Eastern Mediterranean. Could the lost continent simply have been one of these civilizations? When my guide showed me some script that looked like this, she asked me if I could read it, and I said, no, and neither can you. The fact is, no one can. Uh, this is the script that was used by the Minoans, but it's going to be able to help us, I think, to determine how large the Minoan Empire, or at least the cultural area, was. Now, in comparison, there is another script that was developed after this script. It's called Linear, this is called Linear A, the next one is called Linear B. Linear B was broken by the uh, decoder Michael Ventris in the 1950s. It turns out to be Greek, and it's associated with Mycenaeans on the mainland. This map shows where Linear A writings have been found uh, on the island of Crete. Uh, you can see that for all practical purposes, it's all over the island. Uh, this next map shows a little bit broader view of uh, the Aegean Basin. And this indicates where Linear A script has been found in those locations. In addition, there is indication uh, that there was a Minoan colony in the Delta during the Egyptian Hyksos period. The Hyksos were those folks that uh, knew Joseph in the Bible. And uh, there may also have been colonies in Syria and what is now Israel. In the Atlantis myth, the external walls of the great palaces were said to shine like silver. Today, the gypsum walls of Knossos have been eroded by the elements, but in their full glory, they too would have sparkled. A vast royal residence, a place of worship and ceremony at the center of an advanced and wealthy civilization. Using their latest evidence, our team applies state-of-the-art imaging techniques to rebuild this prehistoric palace. We can now see the structure as it would once have stood here, supported by huge redwood pillars. Many believe this was Atlantis. That same harmony can be seen here, in the order and symmetry of the building's engineering, in the way it makes use of the natural flow of the elements. The palace engineers were masters at controlling the path of air and light through the depths of the palace quarters. They devised systems that appear advanced even today, even though they are almost 4,000 years old. Internal rooms were divided with an ingenious system known as pier and door partitioning. Rows of pillars were linked by discrete wooden shutters which could be controlled independently of each other. They could be set to block the path of a cold wind or channel a breeze to the palace's innermost room. At the very heart of the palace is the central court, providing light and air to all areas of the complex. To the east is the royal quarter, a multi-story structure to rival anything described in Plato's accounts of Atlantis. At its heart 
A huge four-story spiraling staircase was built around pillared balconies, open to the elements to form a vast light well. But Knossos cannot be Atlantis, because Atlantis, in the course of a day and a night, was submerged, and Knossos was never submerged. That leaves us looking for another suspect. In the 1930s, a Greek archaeologist, Spiridon Marinatos, began work on the island. He was to make a startling discovery. Studying the ruins on Crete, he found rooms partly filled with volcanic ash. Then he noticed that entire walls of buildings along the coast had been physically moved by as much as 200 feet. How did this happen? Were these signs of violent invasion or something more sinister? Eventually, Spiridon Marinatus uh, moved his uh, dig uh, to Santorini, an island not very far away from Crete. In fact, you can see it on a clear day from one to the other. The thing that he was looking for was a Minoan civilization, and he found it almost immediately, although it was under tons of volcanic uh, debris. The city he found on Santorini was a Minoan city, and it's called Akrotiri. Actually, Akrotiri is the name of the uh, Greek city close to the dig site, but it's called the Akrotiri uh, archaeological site. You can walk into the archaeological site and walk around there, and the city itself is probably only maybe 3 or 5 percent uh, excavated at this particular point. Of course, until it's 100% excavated, you can never be sure just exactly how big any particular ancient city might happen to be. But this one is complete with a roof over it, and there are sidewalks around. Uh, Marinados uh, worked here uh, up until his death uh, in 1974. As a matter of fact, in 72, I was going to be going here, but I couldn't make the trip. But in 74, he died right at the dig site, either from a, a massive uh, a coronary or perhaps a wall fell on him or something. The accounts are not particularly clear, but he's buried nearby. Marinatus uh, popularized uh, this particular dig by likening it uh, to uh, Atlantis. So what makes this particular site in Santorini similar to Plato's Atlantis? Well, uh, for one thing, uh, it's on an island in which there are concentric circles of water and land. The core of the volcano is, of course, in the center. There are two islands. Uh, one is the old of volcano core, that's the smaller one, and the other one is the uh, new volcano core. And it is surrounded by a, a caldera, a rim around the volcano, uh, which is uh, quite high uh, and very impressive uh, when you're uh, at sea. From the rim of the volcano to the rim of the volcano on the other side is about 10 miles. The cliffs on the volcano rim are quite steep and quite tall, and they continue to be quite steep all the way down well below the water level. Now just listen to what Plato has to say about his Atlantis. There were circular belts of sea and land enclosing one another, some greater, some smaller. Now, of course, that in itself doesn't prove anything. I mean, there could be loads of locations all around the world that match this description. But nonetheless, this account and that landscape are really remarkably similar. This dramatic landscape draws thousands of tourists every year. But not all of them realize that they are actually sailing into the remnants of an enormous volcanic crater. Uh, Santorini is remarkably similar to what 
Plato was describing, rings of land and water. Uh, incidentally, uh, Thera is the older name for the uh, island, and that is the name that the Greeks still use. If you overlay uh, Plato's description on top of the island, it looks quite similar. And then suddenly you realize that although there is a central island on both of them, there are two rings of land in Plato's description and only the outer caldera rim uh, at Santorini. One other problem is that Plato's Atlantis is only about three miles across, whereas the Santorini caldera is 10 miles across so that Plato's Atlantis is much, much smaller. Most cruise ships uh, anchor in the caldera, and then they send out a small launch uh, to the old port of the city. And then it's a very steep climb uh, along that sidewalk you see in the, in the center, that narrow road, uh, in order to get up to where all the tourist facilities are located. Uh, Fira, the, the town that's up at the top, is basically just a collection of souvenir shops. There are a couple of ways to get to the top. Of course, you could walk, but you could also take uh, a cable car up to the top. The problem, of course, with the cable car is that although it's very rapid and very convenient and relatively inexpensive, uh, it only carries uh, a few people at a time. Uh, you can conveniently uh, get about six people into those cable cars, maybe only four if, if they're large people, and there are only six cable cars uh, in each one of those uh, trains of cable cars, and the result is that you can only get about 30 or 36 people up to the top at any one time, and it takes about 15 minutes round trip. You may have a number of uh, cruise ships down in the caldera at any one time and they could very well have as many as 12,000 people on board uh, that want to get up to the top. The tourists have to get up to the top in the morning and they all have to return to the ship at the end of the day at four o'clock. Now it's late in the day, it's after 4 p.m. when all the tourists have to be back to the cruise ships that they came from earlier in the day. And the result of that is these cable cars are, are virtually empty. I'm the only person in this train of cable cars uh, that is going down at this particular time. But it's also a good time for me to be able to take whatever pictures I want. I can easily get into the front car and uh, I'm not bothering anybody else on the way down. Off to the uh, left, of course, there's the city of uh, Fira, uh, which is named after the island and, and the volcano. And you can see that zigzag road uh, just uh, out of sight now that allows you to go up and down to the old port. The caldera, of course, is directly ahead of you, and you can see the other side of the rim as well as how steep the uh, slopes are here. The new volcano is directly ahead of us and behind it is the old volcano, the smaller core. As your cable cars go down, uh, another set uh, meets you halfway uh, coming up. And they're not entirely empty. Uh, they're on the left again. Uh, you can see uh, that little uh, walkway that people take uh, going up and down. For each step, uh, you go up about uh, six inches or, or so, uh, and it's sloped, so it's actually a little bit more than that. The steps themselves, there's 600 of them, and it takes you four footsteps in order to cover one of those steps. They're rather large. We're coming down to the old port now, and uh, the, the new ferries, uh, the ferries don't come in here anymore, just the, the cruise ships. It's very picturesque this way. 
But because you can only get a handful of people in these cable cars at any one time, it means that a fair number of people have to find some other way up and probably down. Uh, and, uh, of course, you can walk that distance, but the, tradi the traditional way to get up and down is what they call a donkey ride. There are some drawbacks to the donkey rides. Uh, the uh, animals leave a certain amount of uh, urine and feces behind, and that attracts flies and such. Uh, and in addition, uh, as they're moving up the uh, walkway, uh, they don't care much about those telephone poles there that you see. Uh, they're just as likely to hit you against them as they move up as anything else. As a matter of fact, uh, I think that maybe they would like to scrape you off their back if they had a choice. I asked the guys that work there why they call these donkey rides, whereas uh, these are uh, actually mules, uh, and the fellows that work there didn't know, but I suspect the answer is traditional. That is, uh, in the past, maybe they actually did use donkeys, uh, but the, the tourists were, in fact, a little too heavy uh, for donkeys, uh, and mules, of course, are much stronger and much more sure-footed than anything else that they could use. Long before I got to Santorini, I did some reading on the donkey rides. And a lot of the people were complaining about the donkey rides and how poorly the donkeys were taken care of and uh, how uh, badly they were treated. I took a look at them. They looked like they were quite healthy to me. Uh, they weren't treated any worse than any other livestock I've, I've ever seen, I don't think. Uh, and uh, I believe that everything is quite normal with these donkey rides. One of the things that makes mules ideal for this sort of thing is that mules, because their eyes are actually outside of their skull, can see all four of their feet at the same time, which makes them incredibly sure-footed. And in this case, with this low wall over there, there was absolutely no chance that anything was going to be tripped accidentally over that wall. At least, I can't imagine that happening. They use mules like this, or a little bit larger actually, uh, for uh, trips in the U.S. Grand Canyon, and uh, the mules seem to do just fine.
Is that it? On your way up from the sea level up to the top of the crater rim, there's plenty of opportunity to see those red and black and white stones, those blocks that were so prominent in Plato's description of Atlantis. It's these stones, plus the fact that uh, you've got rings of land and water here, that brought it to Spiridon Marinatus' attention that this may very well be a substantial portion of the myth of Atlantis if it isn't Atlantis itself. But the main thing to keep in mind is that this location, even though it wasn't on Crete, was an integral part of the Minoan civilization and the Minoan culture. And the things that we discovered at Knossos tend to be repeated here at Akrotiri. their dig on the southern tip of the island in the tiny village of Akrotiri. In their very first trench, they struck gold. They unearthed an ancient wall buried under 30 feet of volcanic rock. As they dug deeper, the wall became a house and the trench revealed a cobbled street. At their very first attempt, Maver's team had discovered an extraordinary town perfectly preserved in the ash of a volcanic eruption. Akrotiri is a truly extraordinary find. It is a city arranged with a structured assembly of interconnecting roads and paths, the earliest form of organized town planning ever discovered. And centuries more advanced than anything that has ever been seen before from this period. Archaeologists have mapped every inch of the town, and from their data, our team have built computer-generated models. You are now traveling down the streets and interacting with the buildings of a sophisticated community that was destroyed at the height of its power thousands of years ago. Just as we have seen in the Palace of Knossos, at Akrotiri, there are complex multi-story buildings constructed of wood and stone. <laughs> the first impression is really strong one. This is not any simple architecture that one perhaps would have made the mistake of imagining for a prehistoric time. It is a very sophisticated architecture not just about meeting everyday needs or you know, physical requirements like shelter or protection. It's much more. So you're not just looking at them as great achievers in technology, but you're actually walking into their lives and, and how they ran their world. Yes, precisely. There are so many things that one can stop and admire and so many things that are there for the first time uh, in the world. These people are building two, three-story buildings on an earthquake sensitive region and they are also building in a style of architecture that involves a lot of openings. We take windows for granted nowadays but back then that was something very innovative. That's fascinating because it's a very modern concept when we employ architects now we always 
go on about the light or give me a lot of light, but you're saying exactly. this, this is what was happening yeah. in the Bronze Age. Yes. This is the, the architecture of an affluent society. This prosperity is shared by a large number of the members of the community. That is what makes a difference. It's not something that's kept only for the elite. At Acro Tiri, you have no trouble imagining that there were multi-story buildings. In fact, all you have to do is count them. You can count them three stories high without any difficulty at all. And there are stairs everywhere. There could have been four or five stories, as a matter of fact, here, uh, as there was at Knossos. There wouldn't be any reason to believe that couldn't have happened. And take a look at those doors with the vents above them. They look just like what we saw uh, on, uh, on Crete. Uh, there is no difference at all. Even the Romans had difficulty building buildings uh, that were much larger than these. The Romans usually topped out at about eight stories. At Akrotiri, it's clearly impossible for you to miss this aspect that there were multi-stories here in these buildings. Uh, the stairs are everywhere and you can actually see the multiple stories in many cases. And everywhere that there are stairs, or almost everywhere, they're squeezed, they're broken. Something, something really, really significant has happened here to squeeze those stairs so tightly that they cracked. At one point, apparently, the city had to be expanded over what had been a cemetery. The graves had to be dug up and, and moved to some other location. But where the graves were, uh, they left a cenotaph, that is, a memorial, a marker. And at the memorial or marker, they placed a statue. That statue is remarkable in that it is very similar to uh, Cyclidean sculptures, which were much older than the Minoan culture. At Akrotiri, no bodies have been found. Uh, apparently, people uh, left the city as soon as there were some earthquakes. They boarded up the houses and they took their valuables with them. Uh, they did not, however, uh, take their uh, furniture. And uh, there are some impressions of furniture left behind. Of course, the original wood is gone. Uh, but it uh, has left an impression very much like the kind of impressions that you find at Pompeii. Uh, the object in the upper left is a wicker basket. This assemblage of pots may very well be where the workmen ate while they were trying to repair the city, before the big one, of course. If you haven't yet come to the conclusion that this site was a Minoan site, uh, this next uh, set of photos ought to prove it. It's the horns, the Minoan horns of the bull. Undoubtedly one of the most remarkable feats of the people here at uh, Akrotiri uh, had to do with their plumbing. Uh, they had both fresh water going into the houses and they had an excellent sewer system. As a matter of fact, their hydrological system is probably not surpassed until you get to the time of the Romans. And then again, uh, it is not achieved until about the 1800s uh, in recent time. It's only about then that we started getting things like flush toilets. And a toilet is what you see up there. You see that uh, yellow plaster? Uh, that's waterproof plaster. And uh, there in the corner on the right-hand side, we're zeroing in on it, is the toilet. Fresh running water fed each house and a sewerage system ran throughout the entire town. There is a perfect sewage system running under the streets and these are connected to lavatories. It was not just the discovery of a toilet that so amazed the engineers, but also its ingenious design. The waste fell through a clay pipe to a chamber below, where water from the town drains flushed it into a cesspit. 
The pipes interconnected in such a way that a siphon effect was formed, drawing foul smells down the pipes and away from the lavatory. The design was centuries ahead of its time. Up until about the 1800s, uh, flush toilets were so simple that they allowed methane gas to build up in the bathroom. This meant that if you introduced a flame into the uh, toilet area, it could explode. Uh, modern plumbing takes care of that problem. Apparently, so did the Minoan. Some of the most fantastic things to come out of Minoan culture have to be the frescoes. They're lively, flexible, smooth, flowing, colorful, and nothing has been seen like them any place else in the world. And finally, this is my favorite one. I think she's a beautiful little girl. Perhaps after the first earth tremors at Thera, uh, the residents came back, apparently, and buried something in one of the houses. It was in this ceramic uh, container that the archaeologists found it, and probably there was a wooden box on the inside. And inside the wooden box, there was this gold ibex. It's the only gold ever found at Akrotiri.
a half thousand years ago, the biggest volcanic eruption in recorded history rocked the planet. In the heart of the Mediterranean, a peaceful island exploded with devastating force. At a stroke, an entire civilization was wiped from the face of the Earth. The volcanic activity at Thera is caused by the North African plate pressing up against Europe. The line uh, of contact is roughly where Crete is located today. Santorini is well north of that uh, line of contact, uh, which is south of Crete. As a matter of fact, it's about 100 kilometers uh, north of Crete. That line of contact below Crete creates a, a, a string of volcanic activity uh, to the north of uh, Crete, but south of Athens. Santorini is part of that arc. When Thera erupted, it was the second largest eruption that humans ever saw. The largest was Tambora, 1815. But Thera was so large that it was about 100 times the size of Mount St. Helen. The plume would have been so large it could easily have been seen from Egypt and for that matter from places in what is now the Lebanon, uh, Sidon, Tyre, Byblos, those places would almost certainly have seen it. Uh, there are some indications written indications that the Egyptians did in fact see it. There's one inscription that reads, <clears throat> as for the town of Isis, and, and we don't have any idea where Isis is, which is far out of sight, well, S Santorini, or Crete for that matter, would be out of sight because of the curvature of the earth. Uh, from the delta, uh, the Egyptians wouldn't have been able to see it. Uh, its breath is of fire, and a snake is in it. You shall not come against me, fall, lie down. May your hot rage be in the ground. Now, it could very well be that Isis is a variation on Thera or Santorini or, or Crete. The timing is roughly correct. Another thing to keep in mind is that it's also very similar to what you would expect with a plume of smoke and fire at night uh, that you might have expected could have generated the accounts in Exodus. Into the atmosphere. Then, after a few hours, you have a collapse of the eruption column cascading down like avalanches. The pyroclastic flows begin. You'd be buried beneath the pumps. If that didn't happen, the pyroclastic flow would just grind you to little tiny bits. And if that didn't happen, then the fine ash would get into your lungs block it up, and that same ash mixing with the fluids in your body would turn to cement. There's no way you're going to survive this. There's also an Egyptian stele, uh, which may also reflect things that were happening at the time that Thera erupted. Uh, this article that I'm reading from uh, was printed in April uh, 2014, just before I left for the trip. And this is what the stele says. Uh, the text describes the sky being in storm. With a tempest of rain for a period of days, the passage also describes uh, bodies floating down the Nile like skiffs of papyrus. And importantly, the text refers to events affecting both the Delta region and the area of Egypt further south along the Nile. Quote, this was clearly a major storm and different from the kinds of heavy rains 
that Egypt periodically receives could easily have been caused by a volcano by Thera. Now, the interesting thing about the stele is that we know when it was written. And it was written at uh, the time of Amos, the uh, founder of the, of the New Kingdom. It's entirely possible that Thera so weakened the Egyptian dynasty in, in the north, and the Egyptian dynasty in the north was a Hyksos dynasty, a, a Canaanite dynasty, that the Egyptians from the south, uh, from the Luxor area, were able to recapture the delta and start the new kingdom. It's uh, also possible, of course, that Thera effectively destroyed the Minoan civilization as well as just Santorini. So when was it that uh, Thera erupted? Well, that turns out to be remarkably difficult to pinpoint. Uh, the Egyptian stele uh, is usually dated to 1550 BC. It has been thought that the eruption was as early as about 1450 BC. However, uh, recently, just a few years ago, there was an olive tree discovered. And this olive tree was actually embedded in the lava flow, so they're fairly certain uh, when the olive tree died. And by checking its rings uh, and by doing carbon tests on it, it's entirely possible that the eruption actually occurred a little bit earlier than 1600 maybe 1628, maybe 1610 BC. In any event, we're more sure that it occurred early in the summer. And the reason for that is because the insects that were trapped, those insects were endemic to the early summer period. After the volcano collapsed, there would have been a huge tsunami created. Well, what you're looking at now is a video that was created as part of a project, a project to estimate the effect of the tsunami that was generated by the Thera eruption. And so what we're going to look at is the eruption at Thera, and of course that white uh, area, that's the tsunami moving out from uh, Santorini. And it's going to hit all the islands. Now, as it does, where you see orange, that's where you see flooding. Now, we're going to focus mostly on Crete here. And we're going to take a look at that coastline of Crete. And we're going to look for flooding. We're going to look for the orange. Because when the waves hit Crete, you may have had waves as high as 100 feet, but certainly at least 50 feet high all along the coast. We're going out to investigate the center of uh, Santorini, those two little islands that are in the middle of the caldera. Uh, that's where the uh, volcanic activity is, is most intense. The larger island uh, is the new volcano, and the smaller island is the old one. On this map, the red indicates that the land has been rising most rapidly. The blue indicates that it's not. So we're sailing out to the part of the volcano where the magma chamber is pushing up the land most dramatically. We're on a two-masted sailing ship. Uh, we won't be hoisting the sails. We're going to be mostly using a, a motor to drive us out to the uh, caldera center. Uh, and uh, the people that are with us uh, are mostly French-speaking, so uh, you'll be hearing some of French conversation going on from time to time as well as the Greek and English perhaps. Uh, the ship itself is named Pegasus and uh, it's an open ship. Uh, 
Uh, you couldn't get everybody down below if you had to. Uh, the trip out to the center of the volcano will only take a few minutes, so we'll be there shortly. The harbor that you see here is the new harbor. Uh, this is the one that uh, ferries uh, come in to uh, Santorini and unload their passengers. And the reality is that it's much easier for them because uh, the buses can get to this location. Uh, incidentally, uh, in this particular area, uh, not too far from that steel drum, is where an ocean liner uh, called the Sea Dragon went down a few years ago. It's still down there. They haven't resurrected it. Uh, we're going to the old port now. We're going to pick up a few more passengers, and that's the town of Fira up above. This gives you an opportunity to see exactly how the, uh, the crater rim looks from the sea at the old port. Next stop, the new volcano. Now this island is the new volcano, and for two reasons it can't be the center of Plato's uh, Atlantis. The central island in Plato's Atlantis is only a half a mile across. Uh, this island is much larger and it has been growing. But in fact, in Plato's time, this island didn't exist at all. Instead, the, it was the old center of the island that existed and uh, we'll be going to that one next. But this, this island, this center of the volcano, is far more active right now than the other. We're at the center of the uh, volcano now, and that white stuff that you see on the rocks, uh, that's sulfur. And look at that steam. That's sulfur steam that's coming out, uh, and that's precipitating out and creating that white deposit, the sulfur deposit. Uh, this is the uh, actual center of the new volcano. Uh, and you can see that it's relatively small uh, compared to the rest of the caldera. There are several places where around this particular rim of the new volcano uh, you can see uh, the steam coming up that carries the, the sulfur. This is a clear indication that this volcano is not entirely dormant. It is somewhat active. Mm, I'm so excited. The magma has solidified in the bowels of the volcano effectively blocking the exit. I got the same problem with sauerkraut. Hold on, back up. Are you saying this whole volcano can blow at any time? No, 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 no. That would take an explosive force of great magnitude. Maybe I should do this later, huh? We're all gonna die. Now on the other side of the new volcano, you can see the old volcano. And that rock in the far background, that's the crater rim. But the island uh, in, the, in the foreground, or midground, uh, is the old volcano. And that core uh, would have been in existence uh, at about the time 
that Plato was writing, and probably before. In any event, uh, we will be going back to our ship next and sailing over to the new volcano. At the old volcano, people are jumping ship and swimming over to that area because that's a hot water springs. A hot water springs, just like Plato uh, said, was on the island of Atlantis at the center island. On our way back from the old volcano, uh, the weather suddenly changed. And uh, fortunately, uh, I had brought my uh, rain poncho with me because it's going to blow up a pretty good storm. I don't think anybody else brought a, a rain poncho or raincoat. Nobody was expecting rain. The weather looked quite good when we left the port. This was a real gale force wind, just short of a hurricane. And uh, the next day, uh, our driver, who was 54 years old and born on the island, said he had never seen anything like the storm that we had had that particular day. Uh, the weather was uh, so choppy 
uh, that we actually had considerable difficulty uh, getting off the ship uh, and onto the pier. And uh, of course, this was after the worst of it was over. Now, as the Pegasus uh, returns home, let us return to our original question. Uh, and that is, how well does Thera or Santorini uh, fit the Atlantis legend, the way that Plato wrote it down? Uh, you'll recall uh, that we came up with 17 different indicators, 17 different elements in the, the Atlantis story, the way that Plato wrote it, that indicate where Atlantis ought to be or what it ought to look like. And so let's go back and look at that and we'll give them a score of one to six on each one of those points. Thera is certainly a concentric ring of land and water. That fits perfectly. We'll give it six points. And Thera has red, black, and white stones for six more points. As for cold and warm water springs on the central island, give it six more points for getting that one exactly right. And the Minoan culture on the island, well, we'll give it six more points for that because that gives it the bull worship. And for submerged in a day and a night, well, if you include the tsunami, that's probably true too for five points. The middle walls, well, that's a little bit more difficult, uh, but the gypsum in the stone at Knossos that makes it shine, uh, that may very well uh, be part of the story. At, and we'll give it three points for that. 9,000 years before the time of Solon? Well, that's a tough one. But let us assume uh, that the Egyptian uh, Greek translation uh, got it wrong by a factor of 10. Uh, if they did, then it's only 900 years, and that puts it pretty close. So we'll give them two points. The Atlantis disaster left behind a sea of impassable mud. Well, if that impassable mud was actually floating pumice, a raft of pumice, well, Farah could possibly be the cause. We'll give him two points. And if that 60,000 mile square plain uh, actually was 6,000 square miles and we were aggregating all the land that the uh, Minoans happened to occupy and cultivate, well, maybe. So we'll give him two points. Likewise, if you reduce that 200,000 man army uh, down to 20,000 men, that's at least plausible for ancient times. Now that business about uh, Atlantis being the size of uh, Libya and Asia combined, uh, let's take a look at that. First of all, Asia is only that portion of the western face of Anatolia. Uh, Libya could just be the area around uh, Cyrene, uh, which is uh, now uh, eastern Libya, and it only includes the coastline, so it could be quite small. There is another interpretation, and that is that it isn't uh, as large as Libya and Asia combined, but rather it is in between Libya and Asia. And if that's the correct interpretation, well, Thera is in between Libya and Asia for two more points. Now for as far as uh, Thera being uh, an area or even Crete being an area that was lush and uh, uh, had uh, lots of timber and uh, could grow two crops a year, uh, that doesn't ever seem to have been the case or at least it's not clear that it was ever the case. So we'll just award one point for that. Atlantis' chief god uh, was uh, Poseidon, but there's no indication that Poseidon was the chief god of either uh, Minoan Crete or Santorini. Uh, nevertheless, uh, this is not exactly impossible, and we'll give him one point for that. Now, this is a really significant symbol. Actually, you can only see it at this time of day when the sunlight starts to get low. What you've got here is the traditional mason's mark of Knossos. It's a double axe head. But just look what's been rammed into it. These are the prongs of a trident. 
Now, of course, the trident is the weapon of the almighty god of the sea, the deity that we now call Poseidon, the god that brought so much trouble to this island. Poseidon was fearsomely powerful in Minoan society, both the sea god and the earth shaker. He could inflict devastating punishments at will. This is yet another strong link to the Atlantis legend. According to Plato, Poseidon was the master of Atlantis, and when its people fell foul of him, their island was swallowed by the sea. Another element of the story of Atlantis is that Atlantis has a large stock of elephants. Now there's no indication that there were ever elephants on Thera. Uh, however, let us assume for the moment that instead of 900 years before Solon, it really was 9,000 years before the time of Solon. At that period of time, many of the islands uh, in the Mediterranean had dwarf elephants on them, and it's possible that Thera did also. However, Thera has, for as far as I can tell, always been mountainous and elephants generally avoid mountainous terrain. So, just one point. Atlantis mined a Rickelkum. Now, we don't even have the foggiest idea what a Rickelkum was, much less whether or not Thera might have had it, and neither did the ancients for as far as that goes. So, just one point for a Rickelkum. Next, the Pillars of Hercules. We're fairly sure we know where the Pillars of Hercules were in ancient times. Uh, there are a couple of different versions of it, but in any event, the Pillars of Hercules was never something that Thera was beyond, from the uh, Athens point of view at least. So no points here. Finally, the Atlantis legend tells us precisely how wide various canals were, or how deep or how wide land was at some particular point or the other in the capital city. And Thera doesn't match any of that. Now your score may vary from mine considerably depending on how you wanted to hand out those points. But in any event, I'm rating only about 50% of the points for Thera. Uh, that's not a passing grade in anybody's calculus. Now, before we leave Atlantis, uh, I'd like to go back to the Critias and show you what the ending looks like. Uh, the ending shows that uh, the uh, morale, uh, the, the moral qualities of the uh, uh, people of Atlantis had deteriorated, and Zeus called the meeting of the gods to see what they were going to do about it. And the story goes on uh, to show that at the end, of the Critias, Plato cuts the story off in mid-sentence. Take a look at the bottom there. It's clearly not the end of the story. The ending sentence reads, Wherefore he assembled together all the gods into that abode which they honor most, standing as it does at the center of all the universe, and beholding all things that partake of generation, and when he had assembled them, he spake thus, and then it stops. There's nothing more to the story. Why did Plato end it here?
Immediately after the Minoans went into decline, uh, their space was taken up by Mycenaean Greeks, the same kind of Greeks that were involved in the fall of Troy, Agamemnon and Ulysses and all that lot. Uh, shortly thereafter, uh, about the 11th century BC, you see Dorian Greeks coming into the area. This is a different kind of Greek, uh, and it's the kind of Greek that makes the basis of the classical and pre-classical Greek period. Now, when times are good, uh, people build their houses and their cities on the flatland near the agricultural ground, near the coastline. But when times are bad, they climb mountains and they go into the interior to keep away from trouble. Well, that's exactly what happened on Thera. After the uh, time of the Minoans, uh, the uh, local residents uh, climbed up to the highest spots uh, in Thera to build their cities and make their living. So uh, we're going up to ancient Thera, uh, which is, of course, not as ancient as Akrotiri. It's not Minoan. It is Greek and, to some extent, Roman. Incidentally, that is the airport out there in the distance. Now you can go up to ancient Thera by mule if you like, just the way that you could get up to the city of uh, Fira from the old port, but we're not going to be doing that. We'll be taking a more modern conveyance. Notice there are no guardrails. Ancient Thera uh, is Santorini's second most important archaeological site. Even so, it's not marked at all hardly, uh, and there's not a whole lot to see up at the top. Mostly what you have is a really good view of the surrounding terrain and the foundation stones of a number of buildings. Now this is a marker from the Roman period, uh, and what it indicates is that one of the leading local citizens uh, had repaired this public building, and the uh, city council set up this monument to uh, honor him. Something I hadn't seen before, though, was this bug tussle between two lizards. It's apparently two male lizards, and they seem to be fighting over uh, territory, I would think. Uh, the challenger is uh, taking it in the, uh, in the stomach. The, uh, the champion is defending his territory and probably his girls, and probably his ant supply, too, come to think of it. In any event, the challenger is getting beat up pretty badly and pretty soon he's going to have to take a break and run for it. Well, he did run, but he didn't run far enough for as far as the champion was concerned. And the uh, champion's still on his heels. Now Thera, or uh, Santorini if you prefer, is part of a group of islands in the Aegean Sea called the Cyclades. Uh, they're called that because they are in a circle of sorts. And uh, you can see that circle fairly clearly. Uh, we're going to be going from Thera 
uh, over to an island called Delos, which was extremely important in classical Greek times. This story revolves around Leto. Uh, Leto was worshipped on uh, Crete and on the face of uh, Asia Minor in very ancient times, and her parents were both Titans. Uh, that is, they were old gods, gods from before the time of Zeus. The old story is that uh, Zeus makes uh, Leto pregnant. Uh, Hera is upset and will not allow the, uh, the goddess of the uh, midwives to come to her and help her with the pregnancy. So she can't give birth. Uh, Zeus's uh, brother Poseidon feels sorry for her, so he finds an island on the bottom of the sea and he brings it up. That island was invisible, or Adelos. Uh, in any case, this island is above the sea now, and it is therefore visible and called Delos. And that's where she gives birth. Artemis, who's also known as Diana to the uh, Romans, was the first of the twins to be born, and then she acted as midwife uh, for her brother Apollo. Uh, today, this palm tree uh, stands at the spot where the twins were born. Uh, and the symbol of the island is actually overlooking them. It's a collection of lions from Naxos. Uh, Zeus was there uh, for the birth. Uh, he observed it from Mount Kynthos. That's going to be the highest point that you're about ready to see here. It's above those temples a little bit. And I'm going to be walking up there and I'm going to be taking uh, some videotape from the top of the mountain. It's not really uh, quite as high as you would think it is from the uh, video here. Uh, the birthplace is uh, where that uh, grove of uh, vegetation is. There used to be a sacred lake there. Uh, this area is so dry though that sacred lake is, is gone. And on that sacred lake they used to have sacred swans, but no swans today. In any event, where that uh, palm tree is, that's where the birth took place. Incidentally, I took a nap there. And incidentally, those sacred swans used to give uh, oracles. Uh, this is also the place where they had uh, the Delos Games uh, and the Delos Festival was, was here. This was a sacred island, uh, sacred to Apollo and Artemis. After the wars with uh, Persia, uh, Athens formed an alliance here. Uh, the, the Delos uh, Alliance uh, involved almost all the Greek uh, city-states, and they had their treasury here on Delos. Uh, eventually, the Athenians declared the entire island uh, to be sacred, and therefore uh, they moved the entire population off the island uh, and uh, dug up all the graves so that no one was ever born or died on the island. And they took the treasury away and they built the Parthenon with it. They stole it, actually. When the Romans took over, they declared it a tax-free zone and that revitalized it considerably. In fact, as many as 10 or even 20,000 slaves a day may have been sold on Delos. But then in 88 BC, Mithridates, a king of the Black Sea area, invaded the uh, island. Uh, he killed all, all of the uh, 20,000 people that were on the island and he stole everything that he possibly could. Uh, shortly thereafter, a pirate dropped by. Uh, his name was Apollodorus and he took anything else that was left. Delos never recovered from that. Piracy is a recurring theme among these islands. Uh, Any time that there's a weak political uh, organization, a weak navy, uh, piracy crops up and rich, unprotected cities uh, are a, a pirate's delight. Uh, as a matter of fact, uh, even Julius Caesar ran into the pirates when he was a young man here. When he was a young man, uh, he did what all young Roman uh, aristocrats were doing. He did a tour of Greece, much like the Europeans did uh, when uh, uh, they were doing that sort of thing back in the 19th century or so. 
In any event, he was captured by pirates himself. And uh, when the pirates discovered who he was, and he made sure that they did, uh, they arranged to have him ransomed. As a matter of fact, Julius Caesar himself really was the person that arranged the ransom. Uh, he wanted to make sure the pirates knew that he was important. Uh, as he was being ransomed away from the pirates, just before he left them, he told the pirates he would crucify them. And he did. When the Romans had had enough of the pirates, and they did pretty quickly, uh, they commissioned Pompey the Great to build a huge Roman navy and send it out there and clear all of the pirates from all of the eastern Mediterranean. It was a very effective and efficient operation. The pirates didn't really return uh, in force uh, to this area until after the time when the Byzantine navy started going uh, by the way. Uh, this is the uh, theater. Uh, it can hold about 5,000 uh, people and that probably represents all of the uh, male citizens that happen to be uh, in the area. Uh, the water from the theater runs down into the city cistern and uh, that cistern is a fairly good size. Almost every house had its own cistern. Uh, this particular house, we actually know who owns it. It's owned by Cleopatra. She had her name carved uh, in the walls. This isn't the famous Cleopatra, however. In the upper right, uh, there's a current resident of the, of the island. In the lower left, there's a resident of uh, Thera. Uh, notice that these lizards are, are not nearly the same. The lizard from Thera is a European lizard, but the lizard that's on Delos is African. I wonder how it got there. This island was a neglected ruin for over 2,000 years, but in 1872 the French came in and started doing excavations. They're still at it, although they're going quite slowly. 